here at Kerrville Bible Church. We do this the first Sunday of each month, and it's a time where we focus our hearts and minds and attention on remembering Christ and what he did for us. Uh, a new title, if you're in the live stream booth, I, I do this to you guys all the time because I'm working on sermons right up till like 11 o'clock on Saturday night often. Um, not because I've been uh, negligent, just because that's just the nature of the beast. And so the new title to this morning is Remembering Jesus. Remembering Jesus. And we'll be in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. I begin with the question then, what is communion all about? Well, the title tells us it's all about remembering what Jesus did for us and then communing with him. So I want to su submit to you and suggest to you as we begin that communion is more than remembering, but it's never less. But in addition to the memorial aspect of the Lord's table... There is a current aspect where we commune with Christ, the Spirit of Christ, in a special and unique way that perhaps we don't any other time. Thus, one of the five names for this activity is communion. It's a time for us to be humble, isn't it? It's a time for us to be repentant. Uh, to renew our turning away from sins in our life because we remember what Christ did on our behalf. It's a time, isn't it, to be thankful. Uh, this is a Sunday where gratitude ought to flourish and bloom and blossom in your life if you remember well. It's our way of saying we will never forget. We will never forget forget what Jesus has done. This remembering is good for us because the truth is we still need Jesus. As believers, we still need His covering. We still need His grace. We still need His kindness. We still need Jesus. It's good for us to remember that there is no hope for us but the shed blood of the very Son of God. Communion is a time for you and me to renew our faith. To renew our faith, our trust, our dependence, our leaning upon Christ and the gospel. Communion is a time for us to remember what Jesus did for our sin, weary soul. That no man and no other person in the history of the world could do. It's a time... To borrow a phrase from the San Antonio Spurs, it is a time to check your ego at the door. It is a time to get over yourself. It's a time to forget your past, to stop dwelling on failures. It is a time to stop boasting in your own successes. It is a time to simply remember Jesus' success, to boast in Him, and to remember His accomplishments on your behalf. Communion then is a time and it's a place about coming back to ground zero of the Christian faith. This is home base, beloved. As our hearts are prone to wander, as we stray day to day and week to week, we come back here to home base where it all began. This is a time, as one old song said, to get down to the heart of the matter. And that's what we want to do this morning as we go back to a portion of Revelation 5. If you're new with us, we are working our way through the book of Revelation. We've done all of chapter 5 in one sermon. Those are on our website for your uh, edification, hopefully. But today I want to hone in on verses 9 and 10 because these are just pinnacle verses that need their own message and their own attention. Looking forward then, we're going to, I'm going to just give you a little preview of coming attractions. In the next two weeks, as a church, we're going to unpack our purpose, pillars, and foundation. So if you're checking out Kerrville Bible Church, the next two weeks are essential for you to find out what we're all about as a church. We're going to unpack our purpose, our four pillars, and our foundation. That'll take two Sundays. 
The last Sunday of the month of August, we'll have one of our missionaries come, former elder of our church, Rand Southard, and he's going to come and give a presentation, a breakfast, and he'll have the sermon that day. Then when we're back in September, we will continue on, Lord willing, in Revelation chapter 6. But for now, we're in 5, 9, and 10. Let me read this amazing home base, ground zero, heart of the matter text to you. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So we jump into the middle of this chapter. We're in the throne room of heaven here. This is a future scene of worship at the very throne of God. And there's worship of the one sitting on the throne who is God the Father. And, and ha- now there is worship of the Lamb who is standing there at the throne in Revelation 5. And the Lamb has taken this scroll from the hand of the one who sits on the throne. And it's a scroll of the consummation of all human history. And he's going to un roll the scroll and execute its contents and those will begin to happen in chapter 6. It's the judgment of the world and the tribulation, the coming of the kingdom of Christ on earth, the eternal kingdom of the new heavens, new earth, and new Jerusalem. And so the Lamb of God has the authority and the power and the virtue to take this scroll and to execute its contents. And when He takes the scroll, those who are present began singing then a new song. And here we find one aspect of our worship. Singing. It's not all there is to worship. It's not exhaustive. Some people think that way in their minds, right? We come to church to hear sermons and we come to church to worship. And so we need to, we need to rid ourselves of that poor theology as if singing is the only time we worship. Prayer is worship. Preaching and listening is worship. Studying your Bible is worship. Serving the body of Christ is worship. And on and on. Here is one aspect then. We have singing here in this verse. They sang a new song. Who's the they? Well, it's going back to the four and the 24. If you've been with us. There are four living things, living creatures that were introduced in chapter 4 that are right surrounding the very presence of God. And now 24 elders who are crowned and robed in white are the next circle around this throne. And they are the ones who are singing this song. And it's called here a new song. It is a better song. It is a superior song. This song is new qualitatively. It is new because the song looks forward to a new time, a a superior time, a better time in human history. This then is a new song for a new creation. And by the end of the book of Revelation, God says, I will make all things new. That's what's coming. New creatures and a new creation with a new song to sing. The title track of the CD is named Worthy. Worthy. And that is a loaded word. That is a heavy duty word. Just look back at verse 11 of chapter 4. Because we've heard this before from this same group of 4 and 24. There at 4.11 they were speaking of God the Father. And they say, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. And now these same intelligent, holy, wise beings who know what they're talking about, are now fixated on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they use the same word of Him as they use of God the Father, and they say, worthy are you. Beloved, it's a short list of those who are worthy. It's a list of one, the triune God. So here's a clear acknowledgement of the full deity, the full Godness of the Lord Jesus as He is worshipped here. Now, according to these 28 beings then, these 28 witnesses, Jesus is of such worth, such value, that He must be worshipped as God. Jesus is deserving then of the highest adoration 
possible. And this is quite astounding to me because of these 28 witnesses here, none of them have experienced salvation. They don't know Jesus like you and me know Jesus. They have not been saved from their sins because these are angelic beings, the four and the twenty-four. And so if they can sing, worthy are you for you were slain and purchased for God, how much more so you and I? This is astounding witness they have then. They haven't experienced salvation, but their song teaches us who have. Their song helps us today to remember, to remember, and their song will help us to worship every single day of the week. They give us three simple lessons, but they're profound and they're bottomless. They're unfathomable as they uh, tell us that he is worthy and deserving There are three reasons here that are given in this text, if you'll look at it with me. Number one, because you were slain. Number one reason that we worship and remember this morning is because Jesus was slaughtered in your stead. Jesus was slaughtered in your stead, in your place. Webster's Dictionary defines the word slaughter this way, one of the definitions. The killing of a human being, especially in a brutal manner. This is the same word used in 1 John 3, 12 of what Cain did to Abel. This is the same word that will be used going through the book of Revelation of what will happen to the saints in the tribulation. This is the word that is used of the Passover lambs. It's not just slain. It's not just murdered. It's not just killed. The right word is slaughtered. And this word always connotes and and denotes a bloody mess. The slaughtering of the Passover lamb was a bloody mess. The slaughtering of the saints in the tribulation will be a bloody mess. What Cain did to Abel was a bloody mess. But wait a minute. There's something unexpected here. There's something unusual here and very ironic. There is a counterintuitive reality going on in this verse. Worthy are you for you were slaughtered? I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting worthy are you for you were victorious. Worthy are you because you crushed your enemies. Worthy are you because you came in on a white horse and destroyed uh, the, the, the enemies of God. You see, we're, we're wired in, in, in the fall to celebrate greatness of victory, not greatness of defeat. This is counterintuitive. Worthy are you who lost. Worthy are you who are, was weak. Worthy are you who laid down your life as a slaughtered sheep. This is the essence of Christianity. It's counterintuitive. It's unexpected. It's a shock that God would become flesh and allow his own creatures to kill him. You see, in in his losing, he won, of course. And, And in his dying, he conquered, of course. He is a conquering king and he conquered at the cross. He crushed Evil at the cross. He was slaughtered in our stead. He was the sacrificial lamb that took our place. He took what we deserve. He suffered, he bled, he died, he was slaughtered. This begs a few questions before we go on. How can we cherish secret sin when he was so publicly slaughtered? How can we rant and rave about our rights when he was silent before his shearers? How can we be half in when he was fully surrendered? So this is the heart and soul, is it not? This is the heart of the matter, is it not? Christianity is counterintuitive. 
And walking with Christ is counterintuitive. You win by losing. You're strong by being weak. You're made whole by being broken. And you're saved by repenting and turning from your sins. So the first reason these 28 witnesses would give us this morning to remember and to worship is that he was slaughtered on our behalf. Remember, they know nothing of that reality. The second reason flows right from it and is so closely connected to it that it could almost be one and the same reason. But look at the text. Worthy are you to take the scroll and break its seals because, number one, you were slain, and number two, you purchased for God with your blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Number two, Jesus purchased you for God. Now, if that doesn't help us remember, if that doesn't help us worship, I'm not sure what will this morning. Let's break it down. Purchased. That means bought, ransomed, or the theological word is redeemed. Jesus ransomed and redeemed you as a believer for God. This is the word that would be used of when slaves were bought in the marketplace. Saves with no rights and no authority and no ability to free themselves. They're just standing on a, on a block and people are bidding for them and, and, and then buying them and owning them. This is the word used in ancient times of POWs in their bondage and how they would be freed from that bondage. They would have to be purchased. Of course, this is a, a tremendous word in the Christian faith. Paul used it in 1 Corinthians 6, 20. He said to the Corinthians, he said, you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And in Revelation 14, we, we read of the 144,000 witnesses that they were purchased from the earth, that they were purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So we have been purchased. And, and it goes on and it says we've been purchased for God. This means that we have been now 2,000 years later from the cross that with the transaction that took place at the cross, those who would believe in Christ were destined to belong to God because that's when the purchase happened. Belonging to God then is our destiny, that we might enjoy God, that we might walk with Christ, that we might have a personal relationship because we've been bought at a price and we are now owned as slaves and we don't belong to ourselves and we don't belong to the world and we don't belong to Satan anymore. We belong to God. He is ours and we are His. This is what it means to be purchased for God. You have been destined to belong. You have been destined to enjoy Him. And you have been destined to serve Him forever. Jesus did this and no one else. He purchased you for God and He did it with His blood, with His life blood. In His death He did it. That's how we were purchased. But it's even more amazing than all of that. Because, beloved, when you look in the mirror tonight, you can say, Jesus, you purchased me for God out of the whole world. Out of the whole world. That's what's unpacked for us next. It's literally out of or from, first of all, every tribe. I think what's happening here is it starts small and each one of these gets larger as we go. We'll come across this phrase, I think, seven times in total in Revelation and the order is never the same. John changes the order along the way for different purposes. Here, I think he begins with the smallest uh, unit, which would be a tribe, and then a language, and then a people, and then a nation. All summed up to mean this, out of the whole world. This is the whole world, and breaking it down into components. Out of every tribe, a tribe is, uh, are those people united by kinship or habitation. A tribe is those who have the same descent. It's the same clan. So I'm of the tribe of McKnight. That's my tribe, biologically. You're of a tribe or a clan or a kinship. Next is out of every language. 
Every language, the Russian language, the Spanish language, the Italian language, the French language. I'm personally a English-speaking McKnight. <laughs> I come from English-speaking ancestors. Well, Southern English, if you please. <laughs> Out of every people, this is race, although there's really only one race, the human race, but if you want to think in terms of races, that's the idea of people. This is out of every ethnicity. This is larger than tribe. This is broader than language because you can have multiple languages within an ethnicity. This is out of every people, Anglo-Saxons or Slavics or Arabs. So I'm an English-speaking Caucasian McKnight. And then out of every nation, this is out of the Gentile, the ethnos, the ethnic groups of the world. These are people unified by customs, unified by habits, unified by interests. That's why we even use this in sports, don't we? We'll, we'll call our team the, the so-and-so nation, Steeler nation, Bama. Oh, why do those always come out? <laughs> Bama nation. It's people who are united in customs, habits, and interests. And so this is probably our geopolitical nations. There's some 200 and some odd in the world today. And so putting it all together, for me personally, you can do this as well. Uh, I'm of the tribe of, I'm an English speaking of the tribe of McKnight, Caucasian American. And that's the idea here. He has purchased and he has found us out of all of the world. Now try this on for size. He did not purchase the whole world. He did not purchase every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That's not what the Bible says. It says he purchased for God with his blood people from, out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. He didn't purchase the whole world, but believer, he purchased you out of the whole world. That's amazing grace. That's unbelievable. Why? Because we have no claim to this. We have no right to this. And we have no control over this transaction. This transaction happened 2,000 years before you were even alive. Before you sinned your first sin, you were purchased. If you're a believer here this morning. Or if you become a believer in the future. The reality is we could have easily been left unpurchased. We could have been passed over. We could have been not chosen. But in God's sovereign and amazing and inexplicable grace, the Lord Jesus came on a mission and he purchased us for God. I would submit to you that meditation here will leave you thankful. And meditation here will leave you motivated like never before in your life. Thankful and motivated. Okay, so number one, we've seen that he was slaughtered in our place. Number two, in that slaughter, he purchased us for God. But his death and our redemption is not the end, is it? We see number three, that we have been redeemed to reign with him. Number three, Jesus, this is verse 10, Jesus made you a priest who will reign upon the earth. I believe this is a reference to the millennial kingdom of Christ, the thousand year reign of Christ upon this very earth. This is not happening yet, it's future tense. You've been made a kingdom, you've qualified for the kingdom, you're going to be in the kingdom because you're born again. And you're priests right now individually to God, corporately we are the kingdom and we are individually priests, but we're not reigning yet and we're not in the kingdom yet, that's still to come. They will reign upon the earth. Again, remember who's singing the song, not redeemed people. That's why they speak of it in third person. Not we. The four and the 24 don't say we. It says they. The ones who were purchased. So we're kingdom citizens now. But the kingdom is to come. And when it comes, we see all through the book of Revelation, we will rule and reign with Christ. Number three, Jesus made you a priest who will reign upon the earth. And this is nothing new. Like Israel of old, chosen out of, follow me, follow me now. Israel chosen out of the rest of the world 
to be a kingdom of priests to our God. That was what they were chosen for. So the redeemed have been chosen out of all the nations to be a kingdom of priests to our God. That was a foreshadowing. The design God had with Israel that they failed so utterly in was a foreshadowing and even a prophecy, if you will, of what was to come in the church and in the millennial kingdom. When Jew and Gentile made one in Christ, reigned with Christ over this earth, that's what we have in our future. It says we're a priest here as well. Some would even translate this a kingdom of priests. Some would keep it separate, a kingdom and priests. But we are priests with direct access to the king. We are priests who have been called to worship and to service. We are priests who represent God to the world and the world to God. We hear from God and we go tell the world what God says and then we get on our knees and we intercede as a priest for the world that they might be reconciled to God. This is the role of a priest. And we're all priests. This is the priesthood of the believer. Men and women. Jew and Gentile. Way beyond just the tribe of Levi and the line of Aaron. We're all made priests. Priests then who are to worship Christ and walk with Christ and sacrificially work for Christ and lovingly witness to Christ. That's the job duty of a priest. If you want to break it down, that's it. Worship, walk, work, and witness. What a privilege. God is showing us in the Old Testament how privileged you were to be a priest. Only men. Only men who met certain qualifications in a certain age, of a certain descent, of a certain tribe. But now in the new covenant, all partakers are made priests. Beloved, you are a priest this morning who gets to serve God your whole life. Who gets direct access to the King of Kings your whole life. And then when that's over, you become royalty who reign with Christ in a thousand year kingdom. On this earth, this earth that we live on day after day. The saints become little sovereigns with a little less. The saints have little domains that they rule and reign over. We're little kings under the king of kings. Why is he called king of kings? He's the capital K king of kings because we're going to be little kings and little rulers. All with a delegated authority to the children of Adam. But other than that, we don't have much to look forward to. <laughs> there is a great tragedy, though. There is a great tragedy when we think of this table. We have to have full disclosure. We have to be real Christians, like the Bible is real and tells us the unvarnished truth. The unvarnished truth is some, perhaps even here this morning, don't remember Jesus and don't worship Jesus because you don't care that he was slaughtered in your place. And because you don't believe that he purchased you for God. And because you have no hope of reigning with him in the kingdom. If you don't care and you don't believe and you don't have hope, then you're not going to remember and you're not going to worship. So I want to kind of back into where are you with the Lord then? Instead of just asking straight up, are you a Christian? Do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? Let's, let's go backwards and ask this way. Do you care that he was slaughtered in your place? Do you believe that in his death he purchased you for God? That he died in your place in particular, your sins specifically? Do you hope that one day when this life is over, you will reign with him on the earth and in eternity? If you're that person that doesn't remember Jesus and doesn't worship Jesus on a regular basis, if that's you, I want to tell you this morning, it can change. If you're alive, you're not locked there forever. You're not fixed there forever. It can change. No, you can't redeem yourself 
A slave has no resources to buy his own freedom because a slave owns nothing. If you're here today and you're not in Christ, you're a slave to sin and you're a slave to the devil and you don't have the resources to buy your freedom. But Jesus did. You see, by God's grace, you can trust that Jesus did die for you. And by God's grace, you can turn from a life of sin. Believe and repent. Repent and believe. This is the message of the gospel. And you can do it by God's grace. By God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be forgiven. In that moment when we first trust in Christ, in that moment when our heart turns from our sin that we once loved and now that we hate, in that moment God applies the redemption that Christ accomplished to your account. Jesus doesn't have to die afresh for you. It was once for all time. God applies that value, that purchase. He applies it to your account when we believe. And beloved, that is something you will never forget. Amen? It's impossible. So men who are going to serve us, come on down front and let's prepare to remember and never forget. Let's prepare to commune with Christ. As they're coming, I want to ask you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Lord, what an amazing thing these 28 witnesses are to us right now in this futuristic worship scene. What an amazing witness and lesson and teachers they are to us that these beings without sin of their own can sing this new song that is really our song. Because we are the ones who have been purchased and made priests and who will reign with Christ. Wow. Lord Jesus, help us as we pass the bread first and then pass the cup. Help us to remember that it was your broken body, your shed blood that accomplished this on our behalf. Help us by your spirit to confess our sins and repent afresh and to commune with you. Lord, I pray this would be real today for every believer here, myself included. I pray that this would be meaningful for every believer here and that we would not soon forget what you have done on our behalf. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As the men begin, uh, we pass the bread first and all are welcome.